All right. How's everyone doing today? All right. Cool. Well, welcome back to another exciting session of CE 397, Controlled Theory for Smart Infrastructure. So last time we covered feedback control. So we finally got to the namesake of the course, which is controls. We learned how we could use feedback to essentially uh, make a system behave how we want to by essentially changing the transfer function of the system. So we showed that if we have feedback, we can place the poles of the system wherever we want, which allows us to essentially create a new system that behaves how we want. Okay, so just to quickly quiz you, what are the what are the four main advantages of feedback? Uh, does anyone want to quickly volunteer? What are what are the what are some of the main advantages of feedback control? Stabilization. So what does that mean? What do we mean by stabilization? We can make an unstable system stable. Okay, what are some other advantages of feedback? Robust to uncertainty. Yes, very important. So what, what specifically did we mean by that? Uncertainty in... Right, uncertainty in the system model. So we don't need a perfect model of the system to get good performance behavior because we can use feedback to recreate the system however we want to make it have the dynamics that we want. Hey, what are some other advantages of, of feedback control? So, any volunteers? So there are two, there are two other uh, main advantages that are kind of similar. Uh, one was disturbance rejection. Disturbance rejection. Um, and what was the what was the last one? Reference tracking. It's good that you pointed that because I actually forgot what it was <laughs> for a second there. Yes, reference tracking. Reference tracking. So what do we mean by these two advantages? What is disturbance rejection? What is disturbance rejection? What do I mean when I say it can reject disturbances? Yeah, so it can essentially um, it can essentially apply feedback to make the effect of the disturbance go to zero. And for reference tracking, uh, essentially what we mean is that we can make the system follow some reference signal for our corresponding to our desired behavior. So in the case of uh, the Segway scooter, what was our reference that we were tracking? Right. The angle. So we were tracking a reference angle equal to zero. Okay. So we've already applied uh, reference tracking in this case. Um, we've uh, examined disturbance rejection to some extent as well, because when we were uh, using the Segway scooter, we were trying to reject the disturbance force applied to the top of the scooter. Okay. And we covered a particularly important type of feedback control. This is widely used within industry. Uh, we talked about PID control, which stands for proportional integral derivative control. Uh, and we applied this to the example of a Segway scooter, essentially showing how a Segway scooter works. So proportional control, we initially use this to stabilize the system. And essentially this consists of feeding back a control gain that is proportional to the deviation of our system from some uh, from some reference, right? And we found that this made the Segway scooter behave like what when it was just applied by itself? Made it behave like an oscillator or a spring, right? So we showed how we could use derivative control to essentially remove those transients to make those transients die down to zero uh, by feeding back the deviation in the velocity, the angular velocity. And finally, we applied integral control. What was the point of applying integral control? Why did, oh. To make sure our steady state matches our reference. Yes, so we found that with just PD control, uh, 
the steady state error associated with our control strategy was non-zero. So if we applied a step input, we found that our scooter was still offset from our reference. So we can apply integral control to remove that steady state error. So just I wanted to summarize our findings from last session. This is going to be uh, important going forward. So I want to make sure uh, you have kind of the, the general understanding of PID control of what it's for. Great. Are there any questions on our lesson from last week? Any questions on PID control or feedback control in general? Any questions? All right. Well, today we are going to move on and cover an extremely important lesson for the rest of the course. So this is going to be important for the rest of the course because it's the type of system that we are going to be using to model most of the civil engineering systems we're interested in. We are going to look at multivariable systems. Okay. So multivariable systems are important because most real world civil engineering problems or most real world civil engineering systems will be multivariable. All right, so what do I mean by a multivariable system? Well, essentially a multivariable system is one in which we have possibly multiple inputs, multiple outputs, and multiple states. Okay, so a multivariable system. Let's just draw a block diagram here. Okay, so this is our system. We may have multiple different inputs coming in. So we may have, for instance, U1, U2, U3. We may have multiple outputs. So we might have Y1, Y2. And inside of this system, we may have multiple different states. So we may have, you know, as many like arbitrary number of internal states, but we may have X1, X2, X3, X4. And note that these can all be different dimensions, right? So we might have three inputs, four states, two outputs, and so on. So just based on this kind of uh, theoretical definition, of a multivariable system. What kind of real world civil engineering systems can you think of that would be best described by a multivariable model? Sorry? Yeah, so uh, for instance, we might have a, we might have a truss system consisting of multiple members. So I'll just, I'll just draw some of these examples on this next slide here. We may have a truss, right? And we have, um, you know, multiple members, something like this, um, you know, we might have a truss and each one of these members might have its own state. So you might have the, uh, you know, this displacements inside each of these members and you might have forces coming in at multiple points. So you may have a force here and a force here. So one example would be a complex structural system consisting of many members in which you have to track the internal states of each one of those members. Okay, what are some other examples of multivariable systems that you can think of? It could be either one, depending on how you define your system. So you can define a model in terms of the internal stresses. You may define it in terms of the displacements around each of the joints, for instance. So like, for instance, you may look at, you know, the position of each one of these joints. Okay, and so that will be some model in terms of the displacement of the joints uh, based on the forces that are applied. So really it just depends what you want to, how you want to model your system. Uh, displacement, the output. Or is it just, can it also be a It can also be an internal state. So you could think of this system as like a, 
uh, a, 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 essentially a system of spring mass dampers connected in, in this different uh, types of topologies. So you can model it the same way we've been doing with our structural system, except with multiple components connected together. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So what are what are some other examples of multivariables you can multivariable systems that you can think of? Maybe from your uh, domain in civil engineering. Water quality models. Water quality models. So uh, let's let's go to that one first. So maybe we have a water treatment train. So we might have, you know, different unit processes connected in series. So we might have uh, sedimentation, sedimentation, um, loculation. I'm just remembering from uh, when I took unit processes, um, you know, chlorination, and so on. And we might be modeling the internal uh, concentration of bacteria or something like that. Um, so we have multiple different processes connected in series. Uh, there was another another response. What was the system you were thinking of? Pipe flow networks. Yeah. So we might have pipe networks. And this is one that I know a bit about. So we might have, you know, a network of pipes connected together. This might be a pressurized water distribution network. And we might have some sort of scheme where we're applying um, continuity, so a mass balance and uh, momentum across each element. So typically continuity would be applied around each junction, momentum would be applied around each link. And so you end up with this large system of differential equations. So there's various examples uh, of multivariable systems that we can think of. Most civil engineering systems that you're going to be dealing with will be multivariable. Um, so yeah, those are some, some great examples. Um, any questions or other, other examples you want to give before I move on? Okay, great. So as I kind of hinted at, when you're dealing with multivariable systems, generally, for the purposes of this class, we will be dealing with systems of ordinary differential equations. Um, and for this class in particular, systems of linear ordinary differential equations. So whereas previously, we've been looking at just single ordinary differential equations, when we're dealing with multivariable systems, you will have a set or system of uh, differential equations that must be solved simultaneously. Okay, so let me write that down. Okay, so we have that our system, our system consists of a system of n and I'll just write, our system consists of a system of n first order uh, differential equations or difference equations. So we have that, you know, assuming we have, uh, assuming we have, n internal states we have that our system is described by a system of n first order differential or difference equations. Okay, so we'll have n internal states, x1, x2, x3, and so on, all the way up to xn. Okay, are there any questions about this setup? So Typically, we will say if we have n internal states, um, our system our system state
is described by a state vector. Okay, so over the next couple of classes, we'll start getting more into the linear algebra component of the class, but our system will be described by a state vector, which I'll call X uh, underline. So note that in any case now, from now on in the class, when I underline a variable, that means that it will be a vector. Okay, so we have a state vector X that we will say is in Rn. Okay, has anyone seen this notation before? Okay, so when I say that a vector is in Rn, this means that is it is in the set of length n real valued vectors. Okay, so for example, x. This is just an example because x could be many different things. Um, as an example, we might have x bar is equal to the following vector, x1, x2, x3, so on, all the way to xn. And if we are in the set of length n real valued vectors, that means that each of these elements will be a real number. So note that it is possible for x to also be in the complex numbers, um, just depending on what system we're looking at. But we will be dealing with essentially vector valued systems at this point. So systems with a vector valued state. All right, so as I mentioned, this system is described by n first order equations. So I will just write them in the general case right now. Um, we won't say whether they're linear, nonlinear, time varying, or time invariant yet. So for continuous time in the general case, we have that we have n first order equations, first order differential equations. So x1 dot at time t is equal to some function f1 of x1 of t, x2 of t, and so on, all the way to xn of t. Uh, and we may also have uh, inputs, which I'll just write as ut, but this could also be u1 of t, u2 of t, and so on. Uh, and it also might be a direct function of time. Okay. And this applies for all x dots all the way through xn dot. Okay, this will be a function fn of x1 of t, x2 of t, all the way through xn of t, u of t, t. So that's for the continuous time case. We express our system of equations as n first order differential equations uh, in terms of each of our state variables x1 through xn. So you have the uh, first der the derivative of x1 of t, the derivative of x2 of t, and the derivative of x all the way through xn of t described by this set of equations. Okay, for discrete time, it's much the same. The only difference is that instead of using the first order derivative here, we have um, a difference equation instead. So we might have x1 at time k plus 1 is equal to f1 of x1 at time k all the way through xn at time k, u at time k, and k itself. And this goes all the way through xn. So you have xn at time k plus 1 is equal to fn of xn at time k, and so on, all the way through xn at time k. Sorry, this should be x1 of x1 of k here. U of k and k itself. Okay, so this is just the most general way we can express these multivariable systems as a set of either first order differential equations or a set of first order difference equations. Okay, and the system of equations in either case must be solved simultaneously to determine uh, your response x. All right, are there any questions just on this general formulation before I move on? No? Okay, so in the case of linear systems, this formulation becomes much simpler 
for the case of continuous time systems in particular, I'm just going to be looking at continuous time and we can reason about discrete time systems analogously. But for continuous time systems, instead of expressing our system as a system of n equations, we can actually write it succinctly in the form of a matrix equation. Okay, so we have in general for a time, possibly time varying system, we have that x dot of t underline is equal to a t, where a t is a matrix times x of t plus b of t times u of t. Okay, so note here that x dot of t is a vector, x of t is also a vector, u of t is a vector, and a t and b t are matrices. So we can write this out um, explicitly. I just want to give you this one example of how it can be written out in full. So this x dot of t can be written as x one of t dot. Okay, and this goes all the way through x n of t dot. Okay, it's equal to a. So our a matrix is a matrix of coefficients. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have a one one of t. Okay, this goes all the way through a one n of t. Okay. In the first column, we have a11 of t going all the way down to a n1 of t. Okay. And in the bottom left-hand corner, we have a n n of t times our state vector x1 of t all the way through x n of t. And then for this b t u t, again, it's kind of the same story. We'll have plus b11 of t all the way through b1p of t. So note that u and b might have different dimensions. And we'll go through uh, our review of linear algebra starting next time uh, and kind of just recap what you know how matrices work um, and how the dimensions need to be compatible and so on. But we'll end up with a matrix of something like bp1 of t, sorry, this should be bn1 of t, all the way through bnp of t, times our input vector, which will be u1 of t through up of t. Okay, so this is what we really mean when we're writing our system in state space form like this. Our, our, our vectors x dot of t, x of t, and u of t are all uh, vectors. So x dot of t uh, and x of t will be the same dimension, but u of t may be a different dimension. And then a and b are two matrices. Okay, okay so that is generally how we will write our multivariable systems. I'll go through a couple examples of this uh, later on in class, but I just want to note some terminology here. So we have that x of t is in Rn, and this is our state vector. This terminology is important because I'll be using it later on today. U of t is in R of p, and this is our input vector or exogenous input. A of t is in R n by n. So it's in the uh, set of n by n real valued matrices. And this is our system matrix. And finally, B of t is in R uh, n by p. And this is called our input matrix. Okay, so you'll see this form all over the place. Um, this is used in controls specifically, but it's also used in many subjects that just um, do any kind of dynamical modeling of physical systems. So you'll see the state space form crop up uh, over and over again. Okay, are there any questions about this general form? So this is called, uh, actually, let me hold off on that. Um, this is called the uh, state equation here.
Okay. It's the equation that describes the evolution of our system states over time. Okay, so in multivariable systems, unlike for the single variable case, we may not have access to all of the internal states of the system. So we may only be able to observe certain states um, or we may, we may only be able to observe some function of the internal states of the system. And I'll give a couple examples of this later on in class. So in order to fully describe the output of the system, we need to not only describe the evolution of states, but also an, we must have an equation that describes what we can observe about the system. And that takes us to the observation equation. Okay. So the observation equation essentially just describes what outputs we can observe from the full dynamical system. And it takes the following form. We have that y of t, our output, is equal to some matrix c of t times our state vector x of t plus some matrix d of t times our input vector u of t. So essentially what this equation does is it, it specifies some function that describes what we can observe about the system. I'll take you through a couple examples of this um, in a minute. Uh, but let me just note here that y of t, this is in R of M as in Mike. This is the observed output. C of t is in R M by N, so Mike by November. This is our observation matrix. And D of T, this is in R M by P. And this is our feed through matrix. Okay, so um, this last part, D, D of T, the feed through matrix, this is relatively rare, um, but it essentially just accounts for situations where the input bleeds through into the observed output. Uh, so you may have some systems where the input appears in the observed output and that matrix is here to describe that dynamic. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, uh, well, uh, first, are there any questions on the observation equation before I move on? Because this, uh, this is something that can be a bit hard to grasp at first. Uh, you'll see a couple examples. It's particularly important when we get to the estimation part of the course, uh, state estimation. So are there any questions on this formulation on the observation equation before we move on? Okay. So to summarize, we have a couple different cases here. Uh, so for linear time-varying systems, I just want to write the general state space form. We have that for the continuous time case, our state space form is described by the following set of two equations, two matrix equations, x dot of t is equal to a t x t plus b t u t. So this is something to get familiar with because you'll see it a lot. And our observed output y t is equal to c of t x of t plus d of t u of t. For the discrete time case, let's write it here. We have that x at time k plus one is equal to a k times x of k plus b k times u of k. And our output y at time k is equal to ck x of k plus dk 
UK. Okay, so when taken together, these two equations, either for the continuous time case or the discrete time case, this is the state space form. So when I say the, I say the phrase state space equations, uh, this is what I mean. When we talk about a system being in state space form, this is what I mean. All right, are there any questions on this before I move on? Okay, for LTI systems, I just want to quickly note, for LTI systems, this formulation simplifies. So for continuous, what do you think happens to our state space equations for the continuous time case if it becomes LTI? What's the difference here? Yeah, so A and B and C and D will not be functions of time. So you can write our system, and I'll just do it in shorthand here. Uh, X dot of T is equal to AX plus BU. And Y of T is equal to CX plus DU. And for this class, we will mostly be working with equations of this form, uh, of the LTI form. Okay, so get familiar with this form because you'll be seeing it a lot going forward. Great. Are there any questions? Any questions before we move on? So let's go through a couple examples of um, let's go through a couple examples of creating state space models for different civil engineering systems. Okay, we previously looked at the example of a tank that was full of water. So let's extend this uh, analysis and let's look at a system of two tanks. Let's look at a two tank system. Okay, so we're going to have a pipe coming in. We have a tank. Okay, that tank has its own outlet, and that's going to empty into a second tank, which has its own outlet pipe. Let me draw the bottom of the pipe here, or sorry, the bottom of the tank. All right, so we have some inflow coming into the first tank. So I'll call this Q. We have some inflow coming into the first tank. We have some water level in the tank. So in the first tank, I will call this water level H1. We have some water level in the second tank, which I will call H2. And then we have some dimensions associated with the tanks. So we'll say that the bottom area of tank one, we'll call it A1. And the bottom area of tank two, we'll call A2. All right. So when we have this two tank system like this, we have flow coming in that's creating some volume of water in tank one. We'll also have flow coming from the first tank to the second tank, okay? Um, so in this case, let's say that we have a long pipe coming out of each tank. So in this case, we can describe the flow as a linear function of the head. So in homework two, you looked at a case where the outflow was a nonlinear function of the head. Uh, if you have a long enough pipe coming out of a tank, you can use uh, what's called Poiseuille's law to describe the flow out of that tank, which will be a linear function of the applied head. Okay, so we have that our flow out of the first tank, let's say that Q, 
um, this Q here. So let's call this Q1. Let's call this Q2. This is going to be equal to K some constant times H1. Uh, actually, let's call it K1. Okay. And the outflow coming out of the second tank will be equal to Q3, which is equal to K2 times H2. Okay. So we know that for either of these tanks, from a mass balance, we have that the rate of change, the time rate of change of volume is equal to what? The time rate of change of volume in the tank is equal to what? So let's let's uh, think about tank one. What is the rate of change of volume equal to? Yeah, so it'll be the flow in minus the flow out. Okay, so we can apply this law to both of these tanks to come up with a set of equations. So let's first take a look at tank one. So for tank one, how can we write the rate of change of volume? What is the rate of change of volume equal to in terms of the variables that we have? Yeah, A times H1 dot. So we have A, sorry, A1 times H1 dot is equal to the flow in, which I called Q, minus the flow out, which we defined as K1 H1, where K is just some constant. Okay, so for tank one, we have that A1 times H1 dot is equal to H minus K1 H1. Uh, I guess, oh yes, okay, so I guess, yeah, I did call it Q1 here. So let's call it Q1 to just be consistent. Okay, so for tank two, using a similar line of reasoning, we have that A2 times H2 dot is equal to Q2 minus Q3, okay. which we can re-express as, what is Q2 equal to? K1 times H1, and then Q3 is K2 times H2. So we'll have K1 H1 minus K2 H2. And let's go ahead and isolate the H dots over on the left-hand side. So here we will have H1 dot is equal to Q1 over A1 minus K1 over A1 times H1. And over here for tank two, we'll have that H dot two is equal to K1 over A2 times H1 minus K2 over A2 times H2. All right, so now what can we do? How can we put this in state space form? So let's write out our state space form. So I'm first I'm going to write out our uh, left-hand side vector. So we have h1 of dot and h2 of dot is equal to some matrix A times h1, h2 plus some matrix B times Q1. And so we just have one input. Our input is a scalar variable in this case. Okay, so let's go ahead and fill out these matrices. First, looking at our equations here, what should the coefficients be in this first row? So yes, so this one will be minus K1 over A1, right? And then the second one will be zero because the first equation doesn't depend on H2 in any way. And what about over here for the B matrix? What's the value for the first row? Say one 
or one over one over a one, right? So note that uh, just by matrix algebra, when we're looking at this row, we're taking k one over a one, so negative k one over a one times h one plus zero times h two, right? And then over here for this matrix, we are adding one over a one times q one. Okay, so that describes our first equation. What do the coefficients need to be for the second row for the A matrix? Looking at this equation here. Okay, so we'll have K1 over A2 and yeah, minus K2 over A2. And then what about for the B matrix here? Zero. That is correct. Okay, so this is how we can write our two tank system in state space form. Essentially, we just take our system of linear equations and we express it in matrix form. Okay, so nothing, nothing too difficult there. Okay, so this is our state equation. Okay, so that's our state equation. Now let's say we have a sensor only located on the second tank. Okay, let's say we have a sensor that measures the depth of the second tank. How would we write our observation equation? So I'll write for sensor, uh, for a depth sensor. on second tank, how would we write our observation equation? So we have that, let's say we can write the output of this sensor as y as a scalar is equal to h2. How can we write our observation equation? So we'll have y is equal to some matrix C times our state vector h1, h2 plus some matrix D times our input Q1. Okay, so what are the elements of our C matrix here? Zero, one, that's correct. Because our output is simply equal to H2. Therefore, if we want Y to equal H2, this just needs to be a row vector zero, one times our state vector H1, H2. And the element of D you can see is zero because the flow does not appear in our um, in our output at all. Okay, let's think a little, uh, let's say we have a bit of a more challenging observation equation. So let's say we observe the pressure difference between tanks. Okay, so we observe P1 minus P2, where P is equal to rho GH. So the density of water times uh, acceleration due to gravity times the depth uh, or the, the head. So how would we express our observation equation in this case? Okay, so we're observing P1 minus P2. What would our observation equation be for this case? Okay, so first we have that P1 is equal to rho G H1. P2 is equal to rho G H2. Y is equal to P1 minus P2. Therefore, what does our C matrix need to be? Yeah, so it'll be, for this first element, what will it be? Rho G. And for the second element, what will it be? Negative rho G. Very good. And we don't have any feed through, so this matrix is zero. Right. So you can use the observation equation to either express uh, a subset of states that you have some ability to observe, like in the first case, or you may have some function of the states that you can observe 
uh, as in the second case. And note that this observation equation may also be nonlinear for real world systems. So you may have some nonlinear function of the states that you can observe. Okay, are there any questions on this example before I move on? Any questions on the observation equation? Not off the top of my head. Yeah, not off the top of my head. Let me know if you think of any. Yeah, yeah I can't think of any either. <laughs> so um, I will know. Okay, so there are some systems where, okay, so particularly if you have a transfer function that is not proper. So if you have the same order on the numerator that on, that's on the denominator, you will often end up with um, your output equation involving the input in some way. And that's one case where I can think of. So like imagine we have our structural system and you have an accelerometer, then you have S squared on the numerator and on the denominator you have MS squared plus CS plus K. So then for that case, in order to, in order to express that in state space form, you'll end up with a form that um, has an input component coming through. And that's just a, comes from the fact that it's non-proper. Yeah. Okay, good question. Any other questions on this example? All right, let's move on. So, Another important application of the state space form is you can use it to essentially have a systematic way to express higher order systems. Um, so we'll be taking a look back at our old friend, the structural system, and we'll show how we can express this system in state space form. So this is an important technique to know. Okay, so we have our structural system, spring mass damper system. Okay, it is fixed to the ground. It has uh, stiffness K damping C mass M. We have some input force F of T and some displacement X of T. And we know um, at this point that the dynamics are described by Newton's second law as MX double dot plus CX dot plus KX is equal to F of T. So I'll just write it F. Okay, and we can monetize that as x double dot uh, is equal to negative c over m uh, minus k over m, sorry, negative c over m times x dot uh, minus k over m x plus f. Okay, so we want to take this system that we are familiar with at this point and express it in state space form. We don't have any ideas for how we can do this. I'm going to write out a prototype of our state space form over here. Okay, so can you think of any way that we could write this system that allow us to express it as a matrix equation? So there's a trick that we can use. Um, let's take our variable X and let's define a new set of variables. So let's say that we can define a new variable X1, which is equal to X, and a second variable X2, which is equal to X dot, our velocity. Okay. In this case, what is x1 dot? What will x1 dot be? So we're taking the derivative of x1. Uh, yes, it will be x2. So it'll be x dot, which is equal to x2. And what is x2 dot? It'll be x double dot, exactly. Okay, so we can use this form to rewrite our system. We have our two state variables, which we will now call x1 and x2. And on the left-hand side, we'll have x1 dot 
x2 dot. So we know that x1 dot is equal to x2. So what will the first row of our matrix, our A matrix be? Zero, one, very good. Okay, and we know that x2 dot is equal to x double dot. So what will the second row of our matrix be looking back at this equation here? What will the second row of our A matrix be? So we have that x double dot is equal to negative c over m times x dot minus k over m times x. Yes, so this will be minus k over m and minus c over m. And for our B matrix, what will our B matrix be? Zero, one. Uh, actually, sorry, this should be one over m here. I uh, always miss that one. So this should be plus one over M times F. So our B matrix will be one over M. Okay, and to see that we can take this equation here. This is equivalent to X double dot is equal to negative C over M times X two minus K over M X one plus one over M times our input force F. Okay, so that's how we can take a higher order system and express it in state space form. Uh, essentially, we just find a, a series of extra variables to represent each of our first order derivatives. And note that this, this technique extends to even higher order systems. So if you have third order, fourth order, fifth order systems, you just repeat this process uh, and you'll eventually end up with a set of ones on the diagonal, uh, on the off diagonal. And then the bottom row will contain essentially your dynamical system equation. Okay, so this extends to higher order systems as well. All right. Great. Are there any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? All right. Oh, oh, so for like an n-order system, the entire right-hand side outside, I think it'll just be one? Yes. Yeah, so it'll be all ones. Essentially, it acts as a series of integrators. Okay. Um, so you'll have that off-diagonal of ones, and then on the bottom, you will have your uh, dynamics. Um, so we'll get to it in class a little bit later, but... Um, it'll create what's called the controllable canonical form. Uh, so there's two canonical forms for the state space system that you can write. Um, one is the controllable canonical form and the other is the observable canonical form. Uh, one is essentially the transpose of the other. Um, and I can show you an example after class um, if you want to see it, um, but it, 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 looks, it looks very similar to this except just kind of uh, generalized. Okay. Great, uh, good questions, thank you. All right, so let's take a look at discrete time systems now. We've kind of neglected discrete time systems. I wanna give you an example of a discrete time system. So these often arise in civil engineering problems when we try to model partial differential equations. So in particular, you can often simulate partial differential equations by breaking that system, uh, breaking that partial differential equation into a system of ordinary differential equations. Okay, so those of you who do modeling, perhaps CFD modeling, uh, hydraulic modeling, you will often take a partial differential equation like the advection diffusion equation or the St. Benant equations, and you will break that up, discretize it into small pieces and treat each one of those each one of those pieces as an ordinary differential equation. And there's many different techniques for doing this, but this is kind of the, the general idea. Um, and in doing that, you end up often with the same state space form that we've been looking at uh, for the previous multivariable system examples. Okay, so let's take a look at a PDE. Specifically, we're going to look 
at the heat equation. So note when I say PDE, I mean a partial differential equation. Okay, so this, uh, this equation describes the uh, transfer of heat. Uh, in this case, we'll be looking at uh, heat transfer in a uniform rod. So a simple, simplified example. And for a one-dimensional rod, the heat equation is given by the following. So we have dH by dt is equal to some constant k times d squared h by dx squared. So note that this term on the left essentially means the rate of change of heat over time. On the right-hand side, we have k, which is a heat transfer coefficient times the second spatial derivative of the heat um, through the rod. So this is uh, a partial differential equation. It's not something we know how to solve from this class, but we can solve it by discretizing in space and time. Okay, so let's take this system. We're going to discretize it. So we're going to take our rod and we are going to break it up into a bunch of little chunks. Okay, so we have chunk one, chunk two. Okay. In the center of the bar, we'll have a couple elements just to show an example here. So in the center here, we might have element I. Uh, one step in front of it, we might have element I plus one. And one step uh, to the left, we'll have some element I minus one. Okay, and let's say we have n chunks in total. So the final element I'll call n, and the second to last element I'll call n minus one. Okay, and we can say that each one of these chunks is going to have some length delta x. So delta x here is our spatial increment. And we also have delta t, so we're going to chunk it up in time as well. Delta t will be our time increment. Okay, so we've taken our, our, our rod, and we've discretized it into a series of chunks. And now what we can do is, just like in uh, our previous homework example, we can take this uh, continuous uh, partial differential equation, and we can approximate each one of these derivatives using this discretization. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to use an explicit discretization here. So we have dh by dt is equal to k times d squared h by dx squared. Okay, so for the time derivative, how can we approximate this? How can we approximate this time derivative? Maybe think back to homework two. Yeah, so this will be h. Yeah, let's 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 just concentrate on element i. Okay, so let's express the equation for element i. So we'll have h i at time t plus delta t minus h i at time t over delta t. Okay, so this delta t is approximating dt. And this discrete difference here is approximating our derivative dh. Okay, over here on the right-hand side, we now have a choice. As we know uh, from homework two, we can use either an implicit or an explicit discretization, uh, basically that it determines whether you are going to use the value of h at time t or the value of h at time t plus delta t. We're going to use an explicit discretization just for simplicity here. Okay, so this will become, first we will, looking here, we will take the derivative in space between these two elements. We're going to take the derivative in space between these two elements, and then we're going to take the derivative of this derivative. 
Okay, so that'll give us our approximation of the second derivative. Okay, so note that this is uh, dh by dx. This is dh by dx. And then the derivative of those two derivatives is going to be d squared h by dx squared. Okay, so applying that concept, we have h i plus one at time t minus h i at time t divided by delta x. So that's our first spatial derivative on the right, minus h i at time t minus h i minus one at time t divided by delta x, all divided by delta x. Okay, so that's our approximation of the second spatial derivative of the heat. Okay, so if you go back, this corresponds to that derivative taken here on the right. The second term corresponds to the derivative taken here on the left. And then we take the derivative of those two derivatives, which corresponds to subtracting them and dividing by delta x again. Okay, so with that, we can go ahead and simplify. So we will end up with h i t plus delta t. If we, uh, let's go ahead and do it one step at a time. h i of t divided by delta t is equal to k over delta x squared of h i plus one. Actually, let me say h i minus one at time t um, minus two h i at times t plus h i plus one at time t. Okay, and we can multiply through by delta t and add h i of t to the right hand side. We'll get h i t plus delta t um, is equal to h i of t plus k delta t over delta x squared of h i minus one t minus two h i of t plus h i plus one of t. All right, and let's go ahead and make this uh, amenable to expressing it in terms of a matrix equation. So I'm gonna just group these terms here. I'm gonna group h i of t together. Okay, and so we will have h i at time t plus delta t is equal to, uh, we will have um, quantity k delta t over delta x squared times h i minus one of t plus one minus two k delta t over delta x squared times h i of t. I know there's a lot of math, but uh, stick with me for a second plus k delta t over delta x squared times h i plus one of t. Okay, so we now have a linear equation, a linear difference equation uh, that describes the heat at element i at the next time step in terms of the heats at the surrounding elements at the previous time step. And we can now express this in the form of a matrix equation. So before we can do this, we need to establish a couple boundary conditions. So let's say we can control the heat at the left boundary. And the heat or temperature at the right boundary is fixed at a constant value. Okay, so we can take this equation now and we can apply it. So let's write this out as a matrix equation. And let's say we have five elements. Okay, so we'll have our matrix equation. Our 
our states will be H1 at T, H2 at T, H3 at T, H4 at T, and H5 at T. I got to expand this a little bit more. On the left hand side, we'll have H1 dot, or sorry, H1 at time t plus delta t, H2 at time t plus delta t. Um, let me just write out all of them H3 at time t plus delta t, H4 at time t plus delta t, H5 at time t plus delta t. All right. And we're going to have some control input as well. I'm just going to call it U of T. Okay, so we can control the heat at the left boundary. Okay, so looking at element two, let's say we have our rod here, We've broken it into five chunks. Okay, let's look at element two. Let's say we have some heater that can control the heat of the first element. What will the second row of this equation be looking at our equation defined here? Yes, that is exactly correct. So we'll on the on the first element we'll have k delta t over delta x squared. And the second element will have one minus two k delta t over delta x squared. And then the third element will again have k delta t over delta x squared. And the rest will be zero, zero. Okay, similarly for the next row down, we'll have the same thing, k delta t over delta x squared, except offset by one. We'll have one minus two k delta t over delta x squared. And for the third, we'll have k delta t over delta x squared. For the fourth element, it's the same, but offset by one. We'll have k delta t over delta x squared. Uh, one minus two k delta t over delta x squared. I'm running out of room. And the final element will be, uh, oh gosh, yeah, I ran out of space here. Sorry, everybody. This will be, uh, sorry, one minus two K delta T over delta X squared. This final element will be K delta T over delta X squared. Okay, so for the final row, we have a fixed boundary condition. So we just set this equal to zero, 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 one. So we'll let the final heat just be equal to H5T for all time. Okay, the input, we're going to directly set the temperature of the first element. So we're going to have a one in our first element of the B matrix, our A matrix, everything will be zeros in that row. Okay. So with a system of this form, we now have our state equation. And to compute the results, essentially what we can do is we can simulate this over time using the recursion exit time T plus delta T is equal to ax at time t plus b u at time t. I'm going to go ahead and do this for you just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so I've created a notebook where I've created a little piece of code to simulate this system. Okay, so I am creating a matrix representation of our system. So I've set our number of elements to be five. I'm simulating this over a hundred time steps. I've created an empty A matrix, an empty B matrix, and I'm setting the heat transfer coefficient to one, the time step to 0 0.1 seconds, and the spatial step uh, to be one. Um, I, I guess it can be meters in this case. Um, the units are arbitrary. So what I do is I create that A matrix basically by setting those diagonals. So that is what I'm doing here. I'm creating an A matrix. Um, the last row, I'm setting it equal to one on the diagonal element. And for the B matrix, I've specified it as it's shown in the notes. 
Okay. We're going to start with an initial state of a unit of heat at each element. And our heat input, I'm going to apply two units of heat to the left boundary for uh, all of time. So it's going to be a step input. And we can simulate the system using that recursion that I showed you. Uh, X at the next time step is equal to AX at the current time step plus BU at the current time step. And if we do that, what we get is the following. So here's the time series of heat for elements one through five. Um, the yellow is the heat at the upstream element. So that is set by our input. And then you see the heat slowly diffusing through the rod um, at the second, third, fourth, and finally fifth elements. Okay, so I'll show the profiles of the heat and the rod as well. This is at time zero. Time one, you end up with a unit of heat at the left-hand element. At time two, it starts to diffuse through the rod. Okay, and as time proceeds further, that heat starts to diffuse through the entire rod uh, until we end up with a more even temperature distribution near the end. Okay, and this code is uploaded for you uh, under the code files in Canvas. Okay, well, one thing to note is that with this code, we can also set the number of elements arbitrarily. So if I have it as 10 elements, we get a better uh, picture of the heat transfer through the rod. All right. Now, one final thing I wanted to make a note of, we have about one minute of class. Um, let's see what happens when I take the time step and set it equal to one. Let's see what happens. So if I set the time step equal to one, we end up with the heat exploding to infinity. What do you think is happening here? Does this seem realistic? No, what do you think is happening with this system? Yeah, so generally this system is unstable. Right? So as I mentioned before, um, when we are doing discretizations of real world systems, we need to be careful about um, specifying the parameters such that the system is stable. Uh, and much like I showed you before for single variable systems, you can determine the stability of a discretized system by looking at its poles. And as we will see in uh, a couple of weeks from now, for multivariable systems, we can determine the stability of the system by looking at the system's eigenvalues. So that's going to be something that we are looking at uh, shortly. But I wanted to make a note about that. So not every discretization will be stable. Uh, you have to be careful about your choice of parameters, time step, and spatial step. Okay, great. And with that, I am out of time. So um, have a great rest of your week, and I will see you on Thursday.